Check, check. Copy. Which way to rocks, Lynette? up there. Sand. There should be more rocks on the other side of the peak. What's that? Like an hour away? Plastic. Oh my god. Kill me now. How fast can you get this boat to go backwards? Forward back there too, lasering sand. I'm sure the laser dive bot guys are bored out of their gourd too. Well, good morning everyone. The four to eight watch is just coming on here. We are currently diving the same GEO that we dove yesterday, but a very different part. We're down further on the southeast, right. Um, next to the boundary of the monument. We're still outside the monument, but we're right on the boundary. Um, we're currently at about 1,300 meters, and we're going over this interesting little, uh, or at least in the sonar, interesting um, little cone feature on the top of the GEO. So GEOs are flat top seamounts, um, and, uh, and this GEO, for some geological reason that we don't fully understand, has a nice little small extra mountain uh, on top of it that's just a couple kilometers um, across and a couple hundred meters tall. So we came up um, one side and now we're kind of in the center and then we're going to move across the center and go down the other side here. Uh, and good morning everyone, I'm Brian Kennedy, I'm a deep sea benthic ecologist at uh, Boston University and the Ocean Discovery League and I am your watch lead. Hi everyone, my name is Corley Rodriguez. I'm a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. I'm sitting in the science seat. Good morning, Katie Doyle, Science Communication. And good morning again, if you're still with us from the previous shift. Uh, Pablo Sobron, uh, SETA Institute and Impossible Sensing, uh, working with the laser dive bot. And still from last watch, uh, Kevin, from the Applied Physics Lab, University of Washington, doing the Raman dive bot. Um, hi everyone, I'm Chris. I'm sitting in the um, data logger seat today. That's because we're not talking to you. <laughs> She's not talking to you either. <laughs> Turn your volume up. Hey guys, you can hear what you're saying on SPL. Well, that's off SPL. From the front row, I'm Dan, sitting here on the beach with uh, suntan lotion in my eye. Over to you, Lynette. Are we supposed to be introducing ourselves? If you would like, you're not forced to. <laughs> I'm Lynette, I'm the navigator. Navigators. Hello, I'm Ren, I'm the uh, 
Atalanta pilot on this dive. Pilot us. Let's go. <laughs> I'll get right on that. Come on, come on. Hello, I'm Daryl Talak. I'm your video engineer intern currently. Thank y'all guys. All right, let's go find some sea pens. <sighs> so, um, yeah, it, it, Bram, before you found out those, uh, the lizard team is going to take a little coffee break. Uh, yeah. We get ready, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Sounds good. Um, if we've got a moment before the ship starts moving, do we want? At some point, I'd like to try a push core, and if this is a good time, we're waiting to get a little momentum on the vehicle, um, or we can totally wait a little while. I don't think we're going to run on the sand here anytime soon. I don't know. Ship's moving half a knot, but I can. Okay, well then, if the, if the ship's already moving, let's not stop it. Ship is moving. All right. Science, do you want me to let this move run out so we can take a sample, or you want to keep it going to the. Yeah, we can keep peak. it going. Okay. We do not need to lose the momentum in Atalanta in the moment. Okay. I'm sure there will be an opportunity here. Um, but I would like um, snap zooms when possible on C pens. Right. Roger. But again, I'm all for the half knot move. Um, I could probably get a push core on the flight. Uh, we, no, we can totally wait on the push core. Uh, and frankly, I'd rather you stay out front so we can get quick zooms on the animals and right. start off um, hurrying. Bridge nav. Can we continue another five zero meters two six zero, please? Thank you. You, you can put in a five hundred meter move if you want. Looks like a small dog shark or something here, just at the top edge of um, Herc's camera. I'm not a hundred percent sure yet. Seems like these are the kind of sharks that we see on every single dive but you said there's also a possibility of like a six gill down here oh yeah um yeah these we call them a meso predator um these small predatory sharks are you know they fill a really important part of the ecosystem and they're not that unusual different parts of the ocean have different ones they're often some kind of dog or cat shark um but yeah seeing a, a big um you know Charismatic megafauna is 100% possible out here, too. Um, I'm actually surprised we haven't encountered a large shark yet, um, given how many dives we've done. Yeah, uh, another crew member, Deb, was saying the same thing about octopus. She's yep. very surprised that we haven't seen any so far. I agree. I would have expected um, to have encountered some kind of octopus by now. We did on that one watch, that orange thing. Yeah, yeah, we saw, yeah. We've seen, and we've seen some squid up in the surface waters. Um, we've seen the egg cases. We've, we've seen several egg cases. cases. Yep. So we, assuming we are correct, um, we uh, that those are some type of cephalopod egg case. They're definitely in the environment. We just haven't been lucky enough to come across one yet. Hey, Daryl, turn the iris down a little for me. So, Brian, besides testing the laser bot, uh, is there anything in particular that you want to see on this dive compared to other dives? Uh, I actually want rock samples. Um, this is a un unusual little feature thing that in theory may have popped up after the um, gear was submerged in some way, form or fashion or was resistant to erosion earlier. So we see these little nubbin things. Uh, oh, good. Conrad's, uh, Kevin Conrad is typing. He'll help me out on the geology here. Um, the, um, but I'd like to get the rocks here to understand this. If you look um, to our northwest a few hundred miles over in Johnston Atoll, these features are pretty common. Uh, and I have to admit, I've never fully understood their formation. 
So getting uh, getting some rocks here at the top and on the sides would uh, would help, I think. Bridge nav. Can we have a move one zero zero meters two six zero? Thank you. The other thing on this one I really want um, on this dive is is to get the Sorry, laser say dive that again, bridge? some really good shots on the, the animals. Oh, sure. Um, okay, sure, thank you. While the, the current system we're trialing today, this cruise does not have, isn't necessarily optimized for biology. It was designed more with geology in mind. I uh, see some really interesting potential um, implications for biology in the long run. And so I would definitely want to get some good some good first tests of it. So what kind of biology biology do you think might be really, really advantageous in the long run? Well what you know we think about trying to figure out ways to speed up this type of work. What we're doing is honestly painfully slow and inefficient with an ROV, trying to cover ground and identify organisms at scale with a two-body ROV system with, what do we have, two, four, six, Is eight people on watch to operate more or less two cameras um, that are data collecting plus a CTD is really pretty inefficient. And the more we can figure out how to automate that process, the more efficient we can be in exploring and being able to add additional data points to identify organisms um, would really help. I mean, you he you all hear me struggle all the time trying to figure out exactly what a coral is, but if we can identify the coral spectral signature across multiple wavelengths of light, um, we can do that much quicker, throw some kind of hyperspectral or laser um, spectrometry system on an au autonomous vehicle, drop it off for a week, and it can come return a whole bunch of spectral signatures for all the different things it saw, and they can just comp compute that to a species ID or a genus ID. Um, so in the long run, that's kind of my vision for the next 10 years of, um, or 10 years of science is trying to figure out how to adopt some of these more remote sensing and, sp and higher order um, spectral sensing kind of signal processing into identifying deep sea creatures at scale in situ, and then you don't have to collect samples and stuff like that as well. So you're seeing this as potentially putting a dive bot, or a laser bot, essentially on multiple ROVs and just having them cruise along Ideally, autonomous. probably a autonomous. AUVs, yeah, um, that aren't tethered to the ship or free swimming. Um, that's certainly not going to replace the entirety of the ROV systems, but it'd be really nice to be able to go out, throw an AUV in the water, and come back and know with 90, 95% confidence what where every coral is and the uh, and what its approximate taxonomy is, and then to pick a sampling plan based on that, and then just deploy the ROV in the you know high density coral communities and be able to collect what you need or do whatever specific experiments. I think we found need. a sea pen. Yep. Any chance we can take mm -hmm. a quick zoom on that? Sure. Um, and uh, and so that's kind of you know, I see in the long, um, you know, the one potential outgrowth from the technology we're testing for the first time here. You're not going to be able to see anything. Go ahead there. <sighs> right, that should be enough for an ID. Thanks. So for those online, we are uh, we do know that there is a little smudge at the front of the Zeus cam. Uh, so it is kind of a more challenging dive in that regard. But luckily, we have a still cam going in the back. So we're able to take high quality images, same as other dives. What is that's another C pen, uh. but that's enough for the idea. So, with ROV operations, we often ignore the sand as much as possible and stay on the rocks. Um, 
because we're not equipped to really understand and study the biodiversity um, out here in the sand well. Um, but don't be fooled by the lack of visible life. The sand is actually crawling with all kinds of different um, animals. They're super small, um, living in literally in between the sand grains and burrowing. But if you pick up samples from this type of sediment and start looking at it under a microscope, it is intensely biodiverse uh, and abundant, which is shocking, um, given kind of how scarce the food is sometimes and things like that. Um, that uh, it's really amazing. Can you fl at least fly over the rocks? So are there any like sand, you called them meofauna, any meofauna experts? Oh yeah, whole bunches of them. We're collecting meofauna for um, a uh, for a couple people. Um, uh, one researcher at the University of uh, Independent University of Mexico uh, and a couple others. Absolutely. Now this is a cool. This is a great example of the importance of hard grounds. So we've got this one little rock outcropping, and it is just absolutely covered in life. Um, base um, and it being the only hard grounds out here you know these are probably competing for space we've got a couple um, different primnoids we've got uh, Ritagorgia it looks like a paramaricea in there um, uh, so this ooh, is a trap 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 yep. so this is a great example of in this in this area the corals clearly are limited by substrate to land on And I know they say the same thing about the Gulf of Mexico, where I'm from, where it's um, just kind of like the sandy back to bottom, but then all of a sudden we have these big salt mountains uh, that allow for just this Bridge now. whole slew of life. Can we have the same step, please? Yeah, absolutely. One zero zero two six zero. Uh, Thank you. Can we zoom real quick? Yeah, go ahead, Daryl. Looks like Hemichrallium, two paramarsias. All right, that's good, thanks. Um, and, um, but yeah, you're upside. The Gulf of Mexico is a perfect example of that, is for the most part, um, it's very, very sandy, silty. Um, and anytime you get, not anytime, but often when you do get any kind of hard grounds, um, you, uh, you do get what looks like this, you just get a little explosion of coral life. There, we got a bamboo coral, a couple from noids. And everyone, please be on the lookout for a rock that's collectible. I think it's going to be, be super hard to find one, um, but it will be, it's really important up here on top that we do get a rock sample. Um, Kevin Conrad in the science chat is um, a geologist who studies these features and is complaining about how hard these secondary volcanism cones are are um, to find loose rocks on. And I, that has been my experience as well. We dove a lot of these around Johnston Atoll um, a few years ago when I was out there in Okeanos, and I don't think we, I think we got two rocks the entire time, even though the geology was particularly interesting. I mean, it makes sense. He says that they represent small amounts of volcanism that occur after wave erosion and subsidence. So they're, you're leaving the most resistant material. It's going to be really hard to get a rock from that. Uh, here's a nice feeding trace. I've been look Another thing I've commented on multiple watches and in the sand of how we haven't seen these. So this is either an urchin or a sea cucumber's track through the sand as it moves around, um, cleaning the sand and eating the meofauna out of it. Um, that we've seen a real shortage of this. We, the scientific, science term for this is bioturbation, um, just the life mixing up the sediment. Um, I don't see what created it, um, but I have been a little surprised at how few of these we have seen uh, on this expedition. It just stops, got eaten, or it swam away. So
So you bring up an interesting point about uh, sea urchins and sea cucumbers. So I was always classically taught that they eat the detritus sitting in the sitting in the dirt. So you're saying that they're actually eating entire meafauna, like the little worms, the little little critters all living down in there, not necessarily just the detritus, just the dead stuff. That's a uh, high position there, Leonard. I would believe so, yeah. Um, I assume that they are digesting Bridge now. anything that they can... Uh, can we hold position, please? Can. Thank you. Because they're swallowing whole sand grains, and... Um, well, that's an even bigger Ooh, solitary hydroid. Ooh, solitary hydroid. We've seen before. They have such a different morphology than the others. Yeah. With that little internal looking sea, sea anemone. That's a huge one. That's even bigger than the biggest one I've ever seen last week. Wow. That still camera is getting really good shots of that Corley. Oh yeah, that is gorgeous. All right, can we bridge nav? Angle over and look at a couple of the corals real quick. It's okay if we're sliding off a little bit. Um, we can hold position here if that's fine with the ship. Thank you. So that's interesting that we're not seeing too much life down here, but all of a sudden, just this massive solitary hydroid. And rocks. And lots of feeding traces now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you're done swinging, I would like to get some um, zooms on the corals that we're finding here. All right. Go ahead, Daryl. Zoom in. This looks like Paramaricia, and I'm having trouble with these two white ones. Well, they might be Caligorgia, which yeah. if they are, they're, that's new for... Oh, there's a Victagorgia in there too, baby Hemicorallium. Yes. All right, I think we're good on those two. Thanks. We've got a Norella there. rock pen on the side over here. Do any rocks look loose? Um, this it, one yeah. might be loose. Oop. That one's pretty small though. Wait, there's some up here that look kind of loose. It's hard to, I don't know, maybe that one. I don't know, that one might be kind of cemented. Pick up a rock. Yeah, let's, let's pick up a rock. Maybe that one too. Or there's some ones further up this way. Here, a sponge back there in the background as well. Another Ritagorgia in the background. I'm ready when you are, Dan. Roger.
We have a fun fact from online. What is the mass of a jellyfish floating together called? It's called a smack. A smack? <laughs> yeah, the mass. I know, neither have I. The mass of a jellyfish. It's called a smack. Poke around in there, find around one. Copy. I'm going yeah. hydraulics blue. All right, maybe the one up closer to the big rock there. So. Oh, I have uh, a no comms marking on my arm hood. You have air gap attenuation on the power and the crap up. There we go. Okay. Does it take a second? I still have the no comms icon. Yeah, it takes a minute. Aye. Okay, I have comms. I'm going blue. Right there. Give you some lights. Lynette, what's our um, ascent time from this depth? 25 meters, 20 meters a minute. Divide, uh, 12, 1300 divided by 25. Okay. 20, probably 20. Well, that, that, that's my question, 20 or 25. Yeah, 20. Depends on how many rocks we pick up. Okay, 20. I don't know what they've been getting. Should be able to get 20. Okay. Historically, it's been 15, but with the new um, the new thruster configuration, I think we're getting 20. Okay, thanks. Is that what you got in your notes there? I've been using 20. So far, none of these look particularly loose. Poke them harder. Copy that. Oh, oh. that one. Oh. That one's pretty large, though. I'd say they're probably all loose. Poke the one behind it. Come on. That one's loose. Sweet. Let's take that one. Copy. You like that one? Yeah. I like that one. <laughs> Roger. You like that one a lot. Good I rock. Like, I like that one too. It's a moderate size rock. So we're, according to the bathymetry, we're within about 10 meters of the highest point Come on the seamount. And so this is a really perfect rock. Oh, is that a flat rock? It's flatter than I was hoping for, but given that we're at the top, I think it to your left a bit. Look in your other camera. I don't have a good view of it. Okay. Hold on, I can make it work. You have a perfect view on the pilot cam. Go. All right. Woo! -hoo. All right. Good rock. Uh, do they want the the roll in front of the camera or? Yeah. Victory <laughs> roll. Move it up to the upper right of the camera where you can actually see through the thing. Looks like a good rock to me. Yeah. Um. Could, okay. Here's two pictures. Just making sure. Yep. We'll take it. What, uh, do we have anything in the drawers at the moment? Uh, starboard bio boxes are all open. Right. Is this the first rock sample of the evening? Yes. Oh. Okay. Okay. So earlier we were talking about how this dive site was chosen more for the geology than the biology. Uh, what do we hope to accomplish with this rock? Like, is it going to help us identify what created this little mound or why it was resistant to erosion? Yep, both those things are possible. Um, so if this is some kind of um, post-erosional cone 
where it showed up after the feature, it should be should be su substantially younger than the rocks we've been collecting off the flanks. And um, that might help us identify the larger mystery, which is how this entire site got created. Which model does it lend to? The leaky fault, the volcanism. I don't remember the third model. Should go in one of the uh, small boxes, maybe, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it looks. Yeah, drop it either. Looks e size ish. Take that one. Hmm? You want to take that question? Oh, sorry. Vibed off. Kevin was typing something in the chat. Oh, I wanted to see what he's saying first. <laughs> Actually, Ford off. Data, what sample number is that? So one, three, four. One, three, four. Thank you. Bombs away. Oh, interesting. So Coralie on the back side, like the top side looked completely dark black, like that Faro manganese crest that we've been seeing. But then when they pulled it up, there seemed to be like a little orangey oxidized part. Um, is that just where the barrow manganese has not had a chance to accumulate to accrue? I couldn't really tell what that is, but essentially anything that's that rust colored is going to be some sort of um, material or like element that can rust. So iron is something that will turn a red color. So that can happen either in the volcanic rock or it could happen in the ferromanganese crust. Ferro meaning iron. Um, and then to go back to your earlier question. So the thought is that generally that these seamounts mm -hmm. or geos or atolls or what have you were created through hotspot volcanism. And then Kevin is saying that Th this sort of feature, it's hypothesized that these Why features are, the volcanism is reactivated the after the volcano has yes. subsided, so moved Copy. away from the hotspot, whatever is supplying it with its main source of magma I'm through some other geodynamic process. Um, and that could be ma many Let's millions of years button. afterward. Uh huh. Right. Or it could happen only a couple million years, like shortly after subsidence, so the the lavas would only be a couple years younger than um, the main volcano. That coral we were just flying over, can we try and get a tight Thanks, zoom Thanks, Coralie. Roger. This guy here? Yep. You get it? Um, I think I actually want to sample it since I can't get a good enough look at it with the. Um, I think this is Caligorgia, which if it is, it's the first time we've seen it um, on this expedition. Brian, as we move in to sample this and we see the little associates living on there. We'll see. Um, the smudge on the camera is going to yeah, make it's that hard. hard. Were you, I heard that you were able to bring those corlivore jellies up to the yep, surface. we successfully caught them this Can time. Zoom in there. Uh, and uh, it's clear as mud. Um, so yeah, so that was exciting. We were able to get those. I think those are probably only the second and third um, or third and fourth of that species that's ever been captured. That's awesome. Congratulations to science. Congratulations to the ROV team for bringing them up. Yeah. Where are you going to want to put this thing? 
Right. Um, I think everything's everything starboard is open, or this would be a candidate for a snip and slurp. Whatever you think is going to be easier, given your impaired vision. Uh, it be easier to put it in the box. Okay, then yeah. Pilot's choice of the small boxes on the starboard side. Roger. Good morning, Singapore. Thanks for viewing in. Imperial just standard 10 centimeters. Roger. Kevin, just clarifying your second to last um, comment, it, they would be older or younger than the flanks of the Z-mount? Oh, I just, yeah, I read that as younger. Okay. That's, that makes more sense to me, thanks. Yeah. You're good there? Yep. Oh, twitchy arm. Chris, yep. from what the still cam images from H1961, uh, 152 to 157, they're all of that sample. Okay, great. Thank you. You were hung up on the bumper. Next order of business for science is in this area, find the biggest of the yellow corals. Right. And then see if we can spectrometer it. So we have the spectrometer team back in, back in the control van. And I want to throw a question to y'all guys. Uh, have y'all lazed anything interesting this morning? Any corals or, I know the other, other night you did a crab and a sea urchin and some sand, some cool rocks. Anything interesting so far on this dive? Um, we've done a couple of corals, uh, some of the white. Um, let me try to remember what the, is the, oh, not rigid corals, the corals that <laughs> I am not remembering. <laughs> it has been, I've been awake too long. Uh, oh, we did some corals, uh, sands, and rock. Uh, and we got to see some uh, pigment shift when we went over one of the corals, so that was pretty fun, fascinating. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, th and I think we had the first, uh, perhaps, the strongest evidence of uh, beta carotene pigment uh, that we found so far. And uh, w we explained to the to the previous shift and all our listeners that uh, uh, what we think is happening is that some of the former algae uh, in, on the surface, uh, as they die and they become marines now, uh, mm -hmm. the sorts, uh, uh, the, the, these carotene pigments, which is something they use to protect versus the UV, it's like a sunblock, uh, still preserved as they're going down. So even if it looks like the trail and it looks black and brown and, and something not interesting, we're seeing that pigment there uh, a few times. So today we got the clearest evidence of that. So that was confirmation of, of that theory, um, which is good. And yeah, and we just keep uh, keep uh, blowing away and measurement, measuring. And, and I think what, what Brian just asked is uh, uh, for us to find a large coral so we can literally sit on top of it. And uh, oh. yeah, if, if some of the listeners have been following us in the last couple of weeks, uh, they know already, and if you don't know, I'll tell you quickly uh, that uh, we're using light, laser light, to excite uh, our targets. Targets being water, uh, corals, rocks, as we just said. Uh, so we excite molecules uh, there, and those molecules will reward us with uh, light back that contains information that is allowing us to fingerprint and identify what they're made of. Now, uh, we have a theory. Uh, that uh, even if our instrument is by design uh, far-sighted, uh, meaning that uh, we typically cannot measure things that are closer than two meters from mm -hmm. us. Uh, uh, oh, have, uh, did y'all just lay the uh, fish that swam by? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so <laughs> cool. <laughs> but that was the that was the tiny targeting laser. So this is uh, this is the safe one. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, so 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 uh, this is, things happen here real time. Yes, you blink and you miss it. Uh, uh, so uh, we have a theory that even if we are uh, um, far-sighted, uh, if we even if we're close enough, if we sit on top of a coral and we flood it with our light, uh, we think that we can still get something back from it. And I think we want to try that uh, next. Uh, you know, if if we find something that is uh, big to sit on, because if that's true, I think that will enable another measurement type here, which is uh, you know, landing on a target, uh, making the pilot's life easier so they don't have to scramble to and struggle to, to keep us on target. Uh, mm -hmm. And that way, you know, we can really uh, measure things in a bit more stable way. So that's the next thing to try in the next uh, couple hours, I guess, yeah. So now as we're, uh, the laser is going across this coral, are y'all seeing anything immediate or does it take like y'all going back to the lab, processing the data in order to, to really see the cool stuff, to really, a better analysis. Yeah. So, so luckily, uh, Kevin and I have been around these lasers for a bit, and <laughs> we can we can on the fly uh -huh. interpret uh, things as they happen. So, uh, literally, what, what we are seeing right now, as we're uh, sitting on top of this, not sitting, but we're flying on top of it uh, and measuring uh, remotely, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of the organic fluorescence that happens when you are living, when you're alive, right? So. Uh -huh. uh, your carbon and all your oxygen and nitrogen bonding, uh, that's what we call organic chemistry. So that carbon-based chemistry is showing us in our data points as, uh, we call it spectral profiles, which is nothing other than, you know, you look at the, for example, uh, EKG or some of the lines that have peaks and troughs, you know, once in a while and up and down, we're seeing the same thing. And, and by looking at uh, the centers of these peaks, you know, where they happen in our scale of color, and how intense they are, uh, we can really understand how much of each pigment we have and which pigment are we looking at here. So uh, so we're, uh, we're finely tuned for looking at things like uh, alanine, uh, carotene, chlorophyll, uh, that's what we're seeing. Uh, there are other uh, pigments that, I'll be honest, uh, we don't know by memory what they fall into our uh, window, but uh, that's where we'll get the help from the onshore team in the next few days and uh -huh. we interpret this and, uh, and, uh, and just get get identification of this uh, as soon as we can. And did you say chlorophyll? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. even though none of these deep sea corals have chlorophyll, this would be a potential application is to laze a whole bunch of uh, corals in shallow water that do contain chlorophyll, that do yeah. have those uh, symbiotic algae, that xenophylophore. Yeah. Yeah. Or no, not xenophylophore, holy moly, zooantholy or yeah. zooxanthalae. 
Yeah, but uh, th th that's correct, Kerry. But uh, then again, some of that chlorophyll uh, may remain uh, in the in the in the structure mm -hmm. long after the top uh, shallow surface uh, organisms are, are are dead, right? So that rains down, and, and some of them may be preserved here. Uh, we'll we'll go to the lab and, and verify this, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some chlorophyll even down here, even if it's you know long long dead. But, uh, yeah. And I think we got enough with this uh, coral down. Also, a little bit of a change from before. We realized that we don't see our red target laser. Uh, so now we're able to leave it on all the time. So right now, if you look at the screen, you'll see kind of like a, a red laser. And then if I go ahead and take an image, you'll see that the top part of the beam is green and then it turns kind of purplish. Uh, and it's on right now. So you can see, so when the, it looks like that, we're taking data. And then when it's just red, that's just to help guide the pilot to what we're looking at. All right, so very cool color spectrum. Do you want to move around and get some other um, taxa while we're here and set up for it, or? Uh, yeah, uh, I, think, I think, Brian, if, uh, yeah, uh, like you said, if we can find a, a very large uh, thing that we can land on top of, then we can try this new this What do you new mean by method. land on top of? So uh, sit on top of it, literally. Um, uh, I mean, we're going to crush anything we sit on. Yeah, that's well, yeah. I, I can find a ledge to poke out on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, perhaps, uh, yeah, finding an elevated spot for, yeah. yeah we don't want to crash anything, we just, uh, but uh, we, we trust Dan to find us a, a safe right, so you want to get as close as possible? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, the, the alternative is, yeah, get as close and keep it as stable as we can, and uh, so the bigger the better, that way it's easier. Yeah. Right there. All right, Dan, that's 100% your choice, find wherever you want to go. All right. So what are the top things that you want to measure out here, like a, a coral, a crab, a sea urchin? Spin clockwise. Uh, uh, um, corals and minerals. Uh, we are intrigued by the potential of these minerals to to uh, concentrate manganese. Uh -huh. And uh, we know that manganese, uh, when it happens in this uh, type of settings, uh, exhibits some luminescence, uh, mm -hmm. photoluminescence. So you excite it, you shoot it with a laser, and it will glow back to you in a different color. So uh, so we haven't quite seen that yet. Uh, and we think that this potential trick of getting closer and shining with all our power and efforts uh, may just do that. Uh, if indeed these are enriching manganese, which we believe they are, but we still haven't have a strong evidence for that. So I got to ask, and I'm I know we answered this question a couple of days ago. But, bless you, xenophilophores that are down here, are there any plans to laze a xenophilophore? They're the little small, kind of white-looking things. Uh, I have to see one to know one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, um, they are so, s they cover themselves in sand. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I'm skeptical we would get a unique signature off of them versus just showing a sand spectral yeah. signature. Yeah. We have a strong fan of xenophilophores out here. Um, does anybody, s are there scientists across the world that study xenophilophores, or is this? I'm, I'm sure there's one or two, but no, they're not well. They're not particularly well studied. Hey, hey, Dan, uh, you know, to, to practice this maneuver of sitting, maybe let's start with a rock, uh, since that will be no danger of crushing anything. Uh, uh, so if you can find 
large flattish uh, rock like this, black color, uh, that would be a great place to, to try this uh, first. Yeah. All right. Do you want to ship move that way, Dan? Uh, sure. Up the hill, whichever way that is. Bridge nav. Can we move three zero meters to six zero, please? And we can uh, bring speed down to zero point three knots. Thank you. online xenophile for a uh, person great questions uh, something that is always worth considering Roger. Pablo and Kevin, do you have a sense of um, how much time you need to like average um, a, a reading? Like, or do, you, do you how much fluctuation is if you shoot it and get only you know a second of um, response? Is that enough to get a thing, or do you have to kind of sit an average um, to get a good reading on it? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Brian, and uh, we're still trying to figure out uh, the right answer for that. Uh, it's going to depend on uh, how far we are from the target and what the target looks like. Uh, some materials are more uh, user-friendly for us, if you want, uh, in that they exhibit a uh, higher uh, Raman effect and fluorescence and luminescence. Uh, for those ones, typically we can do one second uh, scans, and that's enough. Um, uh, typically we do that 10 times, repeat it, so as to reduce noise, uh, like in any type of measurement. Uh, for harder samples, like more amorphous, like all these rocks and uh, and the organic pigments and the sand, uh, we're, we're doing right now, over the last few dives, uh, five seconds uh, exposures and repeat that five times. So we spend about half a minute uh, per, Come per down sample. Five meters. Uh, look away. Roger. Bring our head to the uh, southeast there. Bridge nav. Can we move two zero meters to eight zero, please? I'm Thank fighting you. that tether there. I can't really hold it still. So we have a question online, and they're asking why do we point down with the laser? And then you only get like a thin cross section, whereas uh, could you potentially point out? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we we decided on this geometry uh, based on constraints from the ROV itself. Uh, uh, you're right that uh, typically the, the usual way to do it is using the same view as the camera has, right? So the pilot can see where they're shooting. Uh, our system is too big 
for that in this ROV. Uh, so the easiest way to accommodate it was in the back, pointing down. Uh, we, uh, to, to help navigators and pilots with this, we have a camera, and that's the one you can see here with the red laser uh, shooting, I think it's on satellite feed one, if you're watching. Um, uh, that way uh, we're looking down and we know exactly where we're shooting, but uh, that's, it's just a physical dimensional constraint. Uh, okay, spin around. Uh, Great answer, thank you. Counterclockwise, look to the north, west. See me there. It can uh, come up five there. Okay. Trust. That's a good. That's a good idea. Thanks, Chris. Do we have any? They didn't take. They take one. They haven't taken any. I'm taking okay. Is this the setup you guys are looking for? That's a rock. Yeah. Yeah. That's that works for us. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably be here a couple of minutes. Uh, just trying, trying this. Uh, right, yeah. We'll update you on how it goes. So, Dan, I don't know how much it might be. You might knock yourself off your perch, but we would like an eDNA sample here at some point. Right, this yeah. is a convenient use of time. Great. If not, we can do it later. Uh, wait till he's done. Copy. Using. It'll probably. Okay. It'll definitely move around. When yep. I then let's see Then let's wait. Did you sneeze? Oh, bless you. That was the mouse in the control room. Yeah. I was <laughs>
For those online wanting to Do learn to try to bring it back a little bit? No. Okay. Fine. You're slipping off, Dan. Roger. So for those online wanting to learn more about our expedition, if you click on the status uh, uh, at the top of nautiluslive.org, you will be able to click a hyperlink that'll show you our recent highlights or uh, click a different uh, hyperlink and you'll be able to see more about our expedition, a good overview and where we are. See if I can uh, get it to hold still here. It's wagging its tail back and forth there. So as we're lazing this coral, is there anything that's instantly jumping out to y'all guys? Yes. Uh, in fact, yeah. So what we're seeing is uh, again that. Uh, Fluorescence response, uh, and you see, if you see the screen, you see all these glowing lights. Uh, mm -hmm. There's much more to be seen than just the green and the red that you see in the screen. Uh, we're looking at things in the ultraviolet, in the blue, the visible, like you can see here, but also in the infrared. So uh, as we're looking at this whole uh, spectrum, what we're seeing is how, uh, and actually I'm seeing the little peaks here now. So we're seeing uh, not just this fluorescent background, but you also see uh, other emissions that come from Raman, uh, because we're so close, we have so much light, uh, and these are the ones that we can use to really diagnose uh, the, the pigments here. So uh, it's one of these examples that I don't have top of my head uh, what the pigment may be, but we definitely see uh, signals here that are indicative of, uh, of something uh, that we haven't seen before, which is great news for us. Interesting, yeah, as we that's keep, awesome. As we could push in the limits of the instrument, right, and discovering new things that to, to learn how it works. So. Yeah, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing uh, dynamic signals, if you want, as you see the, the laser moving uh, across uh, with the differences, which is, again, uh, a way to understand the sensitivity and response of the instrument. So, very excited here. So, I think uh, maybe we'll spend a couple more minutes here, uh, if that's okay with everybody, and, uh, and then we can, we can continue. But this is really, really exciting data. Yeah, love it. I, I don't sound very happy because I'm tired, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need more coffee. But, I, but I'm really, really excited. I think this is really, really phenomenal. Uh, uh, new, new, as we call it, new conop, a new concept of operation for the instrument, a new way to use it uh, to, do, to do new things. So we're very happy. Yeah. We can probably find a uh, better spot where the vehicle's a bit more stable. Oh, awesome. Okay. Just moving around a few degrees there. Yeah, it looks like another dog shark of some type, or a lantern shark. I forget the family name, but they're in the same family. Oh, 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 and this is the same little shark that we've been seeing for quite a while, right? Same family, yeah. Same family. I don't trust myself to oh, go much past family on those guys. So how do you know that this is a lantern shark? 
Uh, was it the big eyes? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's a lantern shark, but it's in the same family as lantern sharks. The, the squality dog shark, family? Whatever. Yeah, I don't remember what the name is. Um, just, I don't know, the, I'm trying to think about how you know. It's one of those things that just looks like it to me. Uh, but yeah, the reflective big eyes, the long kind of collapsed conical body form, the big a asymmetrical tail. And again, I forget the proper term for the bigger lobe on the bottom of the caudal fin. Um, all kind of look like that and out here that solid black kind of color is pretty common for that family in the Pacific but I don't have a, a Ken Sulak or a Bruce Mundy in the chat to feed me all the fish IDs go right on and Lena. Yeah. Is the deep sea coral conference in Edinburgh still going on or has it ended? Nope, I believe it's over. I think everyone's traveling home today and yesterday. So we should have some some more people joining for the last few days of our expedition. We have about six days of operations remaining before we have to turn and burn for home. Oh, jellyfish in Argus, or Atalanta. Nope. Question for the dive bot team. Would, so right now we have the laser statically pointed down. Would this be something that you would like in the future to be able to like just sit it on kind of a platform and then aim it in different directions? Yeah, so uh, in fact, uh, as we are building version two of this instrument, uh, we are building in a mirror inside mm -hmm. the instrument. So that way we can scan uh, in 2D, uh, we can raster as the vehicle moves or not. Uh, and one of the things that we expect to try next year uh, is can we account for the motion of the ROV to adjust our mirror so that we can always lock the same target. So even if, uh, as you can see, pilots struggle to keep the vehicle in one spot because of the currents, uh, the uh, can we use the mirror to really target to one and stay there no mm -hmm. matter what happens. So yeah, definitely is the next improvement is to have, uh, as we call it, a steerable laser beam. Oh. Awesome, thank you. And then this system is actually designed to have actuators. So it's designed to be sitting on a four meter tall You're tower. You ready for a move, Dan? Looking at a thermal vent and it has pan tilt actuators no, to be I able think, to point. I think we're in a target rich environment for. And you're saying this one or the one upcoming? This one. Oh is designed to do that. We have all the electronics in place in the other bottle. It's also designed to have two cameras and four lights. And right now we're using one camera and one light. So. Wow. Do you want to, uh, we awesome. can poke around in these rocks to find some other uh, yes. targets. Did we, did we get blown off that big set of rocks? No, they said they were done. So I can, yep. uh, I'll go back and find a perch. Here oh, somewhere. you guys are done? I'm sorry, I missed that. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it, done, in fact, for, for the rocks, since there will be no risk of crushing anything, uh, we would like to literally land on the rock to be as close as possible. Um, okay. Yep. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so one thing that Kevin was explaining is that uh, the original mission 
of this laser dipod uh, was to look at uh, active venting. So here we're looking at all volcanoes. Mm -hmm. uh, the opposite, uh, we, we, we built that tube, and that's why it's so big, uh, because we wanted to have it uh, working for over a year down near a vent and uh, be able to scan the vent uh, over a year. And for that, uh, wow. Kevin's team built uh, an external way to steer the beam, which is essentially uh, a gimbal system, if you want, right? uh, so that can pan and tilt uh, on demand, be able to scan across the field of view. Uh, so that project still uh, still active, and we're hoping to, to go there uh, uh, next summer. And this is in, in the Axial Caldera, uh, Juan de Fuca. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, yep, yep, yep. A couple hundred miles off the coast of Oregon. Uh, uh -huh. and, and there is the NSF, the National Science Foundation, built a cable uh, down there. Oh, the ONC? The, the Ocean RCA. Networks Canada? No, that, well, that's uh, the Canadian. Cable, right? Exactly, okay. that, that's the Canadian uh, version of that. Uh, this is the. The Oregon version. The yeah, the, exactly. It's called it's OI, right? It's the Ocean Observation Initiative, uh, uh, and the cable is called the Regional Cable Array. Uh, a lot of acronyms, but uh, essentially, what it is, is a power box, and all you have to do is land there and, right there. and plug in to the box, and you have power and data, and you can control this everywhere in the world uh, and do science remotely uh, with unlimited power and, and data bandwidth. So that is the original uh, uh, mission for this, but obviously, you know, we were very excited when we had a chance to join OET mm -hmm. and, and, and the team here to do the very first test of this technology, which in fact is what we should have done in the first place, is to test it on an ROV uh -huh. with a team of, uh, of people uh, here helping us and uh, adjusting as we go. And now we're going to improve this in the lab. Uh, when we go to the lander, be there for a year, we'll be ready to do a full mission in a much in a much better way. So wow. it worked out pretty well for us uh, being able to be here. So uh, you're getting so many questions online. One of them is, uh, how much power does the laser consume? Uh, so it has a peak power of 200 watts, but it averages around 20. And we fire at a rate of 20 hertz. And the laser width is about seven nanoseconds. All of that means nothing to me, but I hope the online community, that means a lot to them. <laughs> it, it means that essentially we use as much power as a light bulb. Oh. All right. So, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then, uh, is this the first time that underwater spectroscopy has been used? No, it's not. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, an organization called Embari, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institution uh, out of uh, California, they did deploy the very first uh, Raman laser spectrometer uh, uh, deep sea. Uh, in fact, they were looking at a chimney. Uh, and what they did is, you know, they, they bought a top of the line commercial system, put mm -hmm. it in a box that could survive depth and, and brought it down there. They did show that this could be done uh, for the first time. Uh, and what we did is we essentially took that uh, advancement and, and now make it uh, make it uh, better for several reasons. One is that we are better technology now, 20 years after, uh, and also we've, uh, we've been able to creatively assemble uh, a system that can do this remotely. Uh, the first systems that were used, uh, deep sea were contact models, so essentially you had a probe and you had to touch the sample you wanted to analyze to get the data. Uh, that, of course, you know, can be done and pilots are very dexterous, but if you look at the uh, future of uh, oceanography, where you need to do things faster and cheaper, uh, you're going to have to automate all of these uh, measurements. And uh, being able to do remote sensing, much like with, with satellites, yeah. uh, as opposed to visiting every place in the world, we can just look at everything from, from a sky perspective. We try to do the same thing in the ocean. Uh, so in a sense, we're trying to, to make systems that can mount on autonomous vehicles so we can mow the lawn, uh, essentially, we can just drive over uh, at an altitude, safe altitude, and do measurements on the fly so that you don't have to stop, get samples, and just uh, get the science as, as you go. So that's the advancement of this technology. It took 20 years. Uh, as you can imagine, things are sometimes difficult. But, uh, so to interrupt you since no, we're no. landed, oh, oh. is it possible to turn off the lights of Herc?
So I think, let me turn off the laser. Okay, so, so, so what, what Kevin is, is doing is, uh, uh, he's gonna flood this rock that you can see here with... Uh, you want the Atalanta lights off too? Uh, if it's possible to go fully dark, that'd be yeah, amazing. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. So, so, so because our camera is so sensitive, uh, we wanna have everything well, dark. Well, no, the feed's black, that's not good. Uh, That's all right. So for anybody it. online, the feed is going to be dark for a few minutes while they uh, power the laser. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our theory is that some of the black light that we're using to shine on the on the rock may fluoresce and may give mm -hmm. us the signals that you are used to see, you know, in the crime scene in the in the movies uh -huh. when the cops shine with the black light and they see yellow things glowing. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're going to get that level, but uh, we're hoping to see something. Our camera which is way more sensitive than any of the cameras on the on the vehicle uh, should be able to pick some of that uh, shifted light, fluorescent light. Uh, but because it's so sensitive, we're going to open it mm -hmm. uh, as much as we can. And that's why we prefer to have uh, all the other lights off so that we can verify that the light we get is from our own lights. So so don't worry. Uh, we're still alive and well. <laughs> Everything's good. We are turning dark for a minute just to, to verify this. So back to you in a minute. I will be curious as well. There have been some tests sometimes with turning off vehicle lights and seeing if we can draw in larger predators and stuff that are scared of the light. So it might be interesting to see what is lurking around the vehicle once we turn the lights back on. Probably nothing. Um, don't um, get, don't um, get too um. exciting. But, um, you know, when... when Edie Witter's team got the first images of a giant squid. They did it partly by turning all the vehicle lights off and keeping the vehicle as quiet as possible. I can guarantee you it's not quiet. Yes, I, I understand that <laughs> it's not quiet. I can turn the motor off. Yeah. No, that's okay. But it is darkish. To the viewer online that had the question, how do I get some Nautilus swag? Um, there's really no official Nautilus swag that you can buy online. However, there's a lot of unofficial vendors who either take images like the googly-eyed squid and have it printed up in leggings. Uh, there's a shop on Etsy that I always buy as Christmas gifts that make little crocheted Nautilus creatures. But there's no official vendor for any Nautilus swag. All right, uh, you can go ahead and turn on the lights and move to a different location. Roger. D yeah, so... Uh, turn on the uh, uh, Atlanta lights first. Copy. Kind uh, of uh, dig in the, the green screen there. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see as much as we wanted, uh, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep trying, but uh, uh, we did see a little... I'm seeing a little peak here that it's... I don't know, looks like quartz to me, but... Uh, yeah, no, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, it looks like an oxide here. Huh. I wonder. Uh, right. So, what's next on your wish list? Another, another spot, or the, the same procedure? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 th I think we, you know, we'll we'll take one more if if you guys are okay with that. Uh, one more try on this, and uh, yeah. Okay. So another rock as close as possible. Yeah. Steady. Same, same deal. It. Yeah. Thanks. It'd be nice if uh, there was some kind of coral or something uh, organic to see if it fluoresces. Yeah, kind of organic. Like, how about a yellow one? Yeah. Can you, can you turn the targeting laser back on? There we go. Oh, that'd be perfect. Ooh, I'm interested to see how this is. Oh. Uh. Does someone have their headset on? I think we all have our headsets yeah. on. What do you I'm mean? hearing music in the background. I wish, but no.
Yes. That would be why. And I need to find a little perch on a, so the front of the vehicle's up a bit there. Give me a second. And to another viewer, they will be going back up to Canada after this cruise. So when we get done, they're going to transit back up to Canada, pick up a crew from the Ocean Networks Canada cruise. And then there is the potential to look at hydrothermal vents. Last time they did an ONC cruise, we got to see it. No guarantees. If you want to check out the highlights from that, that was back in 2021. Um, really, really cool hydrothermal vents mind-blowing I'll ever hit it. Oh, I need more to dense cluster here somewhere. That camera zoomed in, Kevin. Do you have a zoom on that camera? No, it zoomed all the way out. Roger. I'm going to turn on the app light there. It's going to blow you out a bit.
bushy there. Daryl, can we zoom in on Atlanta? Today's Sunday, right? In the real world? Yes. Okay. In the real world. If I'm actually over a. Uh, if I'm hitting any uh, biology there at all, I can't tell. Can we uh, move north 20 meters? Or northeast? Bridge now. Can we move two zero meters, zero three zero, please? Thank Ryan, you. Is that an egg case? I uh, didn't, didn't notice. I will look next time we swing over. This is great, Dan, if you can stay here. Yeah, I can. I'm completely guessing on... Uh, ...where the laser is actually hitting. Brian, what kind of pink coral is that on the side? Should be a hemichorallium. Awesome, thank you. And a hemichorallia's common name is bubblegum? No, these are precious corals. Precious corals. No, paragorgias are the bubblegums. Yeah, sorry video, the sea state's probably not going to let us get a great shot that close up. 
Yeah. If it's possible to go dark again, since we're right on this coral. Sure. I think we're actually on it. Uh, it's in our field of view, and we're using a slightly different UV source than the laser. Roger. I could try and wiggle the tail a little, but no guarantees. You ready? Yeah. All right, so for those at home, we're going full black for a moment. Oh, there's, oh, it had oh. it for just a second. Whoa. Uh, yeah, I think Kevin got excited because we remember what <laughs> we wanted to do before this uh, shoot, everything dark, shoot with our black light, ultraviolet, and see a little bit of fluorescence. And there was a wow signal. For, for those of you who, <laughs> yeah. who remember contact and uh, looking for aliens, maybe we saw a little bit of a wow signal here, like a, like a, like a speckle. Uh, yeah. No, and, and in fact we did, and it's right here. Oh, and, uh, you can see it online. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, there's Man. a massive peak here, at about 480 nanometers, and that is, Exactly what we're looking for is that uh, pigment that sparks. Uh, you just make a note that working. Oh, they're they're targeting color. a hemicryalium. Is yeah. it? So you have it already. Yeah. Wow! Wow! That's so cool. If Thanks. you if you look really carefully at the Atalanta screen, you can occasionally see the uh, the little blue LED in the Herc junction box. That's really cool. I could probably uh, wiggle that tail to the right just a little if you want to. We're going to uh, do one more exposure and. Rather. So we're taking long exposure, so it's going to be five frames at 30 seconds of exposure. So it'll be a few more minutes. Right here. Are y'all seeing anything interesting come through so far? Besides that, uh, that first initial little peak. Uh, no, now we're now that we saw that, uh, we're we're giving it more time, so we're going to give it more signal. So hopefully we can. If we didn't move too much, uh, we're going to see the same peak, hopefully. Uh -huh. uh, but given that we're going to get more time to get more light, uh, we may see something else, additional additional stuff. Uh, that's what Kevin was doing, is to adjust in the camera to, to see more. So. But the, the, the downside is that you have to wait the full three minutes. Uh, oh. <laughs> before you know if something's happening. Uh, but it's, hey, it's better than Mars. On Mars, you have to wait the full day to hear back, <laughs> to hear back from the robot. So, uh, so for me, it's a breeze, no. <laughs> it takes a lot longer to get there, too. It does, it does. <coughs> Six to nine months currently. Yeah. So 
So I get this question at least once every night. What would happen if we turned off all the vehicle's camera, or all the vehicle lights? And this would be it. So for all those who have been wanting the vehicle lights to turn off, you got your wish. All right, uh, we can go ahead and turn on the lights and mosey on away. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, so, so we got another another uh, data point here. Uh, looks different than the other one, which is exciting, but it also you know means more work <laughs> to 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 figure out uh, to figure out what it all means. But uh, but I think this this is promising, uh, and we're pretty excited about sitting down and crunching the data. Yeah. All right. Really so do you have more wish lists for um, here? No, no, we're, we're done, Brian. I think what we'll do is we'll we'll just do our opportunistic measurements as we drive around, and yeah, if we find something sexy, we'll we'll holler. But otherwise, <laughs> we'll follow your lead here. Have you gotten a sponge yet? Have you tried? I, do you know what? I don't remember if we have. I don't think we got a sponge. No, so we, we have not. Find a sponge then. Yeah. There was. Um, there was a moderately sized sponge somewhere on this feature. I've lost track of where it is now, so it might be a good opportunity to try a sponge okay. if you would like to. Oh, we would love to. Yeah. Okay. All right, in front of me. You see it? I want to go over to that cliff there, though. And do you want this close, um, guys, or do you want uh, back to kind of a normal height measurement? Uh, back to three meters, if possible. Back to three meters, I. So, Dan, there was a bigger uh, stock sponge that was a good at least 10 centimeters in diameter um, that yeah, might be easier for you to hit. But like I said, I lost where it is on this. Uh, that's right here, right here somewhere. Okay. Thought it was. Corley, we have a question in... I don't think this is, I think this is going to be a hard one, but does the still camera have a low light setting? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's the maximum ISO. I mean, I can change, yeah, I can change the ISO, but even if I go really high, when all of the lights are off on her grad Atlanta, there's, I've tried taking pictures and it doesn't really work that well. All right, well, maybe I, I know it's out here somewhere, but we I'm sure we will find another good size sponge at some point. Um, but it was right here, like it was right here. Ah, there it is. Top, uh, dead center top screen. Yeah, I see it. following my track back. So, Brian, is there any particular reason uh, that you suggested a sponge? Only because we hadn't done it yet. Okay. I didn't know if there was, like, some interesting property or or anything. Nope. Just looking looking to try and shoot as many things as possible to see um, what, how they behave. And from my point of view, and getting a couple base spectrum on each of the major taxa. 
We're going to go across uh, this kind of a dense population right here on this little rock that I'm just hovering over now. So we we'll can light up uh, all the critters here, yellow, red, white. Yeah, I, I, I did like uh, Brian's response. It's, you know, this is true exploration. We just shoot it because, <laughs> because it's there and it looks different <laughs> to learn what, it, what you can learn. So that's what we're here for. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we're on top of it now. You can see it glowing under the laser uh, if you're looking at the screen. Yeah. I guess the other reason I was thinking sponges is it's thicker and more massive, and so it'd be a little bit easier to get a consistent reading on the sponge instead of shooting between the individual branches of a coral. Yep. As well. Yeah, hundred percent. That makes sense. trying to balance in the breeze. Yeah. Brian, have you ever worked with bioluminescent cameras or cameras that can detect any? No. I, I have not personally, no. Hey, uh, Reem, uh, could, could you zoom in with Atalanta on, on the laser? Uh, okay. I'm going to, uh, give me a minute here, I'm going to change my head so we're facing into the current there, it'll be easier to hold it. That's uh, five meters up. You know, I can come down a little bit if you want. Yeah, if you could. Three would be optimal. Right, right, right. That sponge is probably a meter off the substrate, though. So if you want three meters above the sponge, you probably want four meters uh, indicated altitude. Yep. Be in a particular color of the color band of the laser there. Yeah, no. So you know, the fact that you see the laser kind of being scattered inside the sponge that means that it's, it's, it's that it's just being lost in translation a little bit. Uh, so we're not getting anything exciting here, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah, so t t try to stay there for a little bit more. Then, and if we don't see anything, we can release you from the pain. Come down, a, yeah, yeah, come down a couple of meters. Have any fish swam through the laser yet? That little guy did. Uh, one, one actually just did. Any interesting readings on it? Uh, not particularly. 
It was for a very brief moment of time, so. <laughs> get all around the sponge, just can't get on the sponge. Roger. All right, we can go whenever you're ready. All right. I'm just going to slide over here and some other uh, critters here. To Ooh, scanning all kinds, or lazing all kinds of corals. So I think you're on a primnoid now. Oh, that's just, there it goes. The Brian, on June 2nd, they just closed the public comment phase one portion of turning the Pacific Remote Island Marine National Sanc or Marine National Monument into, pos into possibly a sanctuary. What is the next step now? So one clarification, it, wouldn't, it actually doesn't change anything to do with the monument. It would layer a sanctuary on top of the monument and the sanctuary would be bigger. So the monument is going to remain unchanged no matter what. Okay. Um, so the next thing is Noah has to go through and um, read every comment that was submitted and do some analysis on them and res and ad address is generally the, the word they use. Um, each comment and kind of summarize what it is and then that will go into a rulemaking proposal process. And so they will take the comment, um, the administration will make um, a recommendation for a proposed rule in six months to a year plus more and then publish the proposed rules whatever they may or may not be and then there will be another comment period uh, for people to respond on the particular um, management and ru rules that may be proposed based on the recommendations of the people um, who submitted comments and the judgment of the administration so basically not much is going to happen publicly for at least six months to a year, likely longer, and then there will be another public comment period available um, once uh, the, the uh, Department of Commerce makes an actual recommendation. If there's like a big administration change or anything, is it possible that it could just kind of fizzle out or at 100%. any point just from Yeah, whatever? absolutely. 100% uh, it could, and generally 
the sink process, the time it takes to make a sanctuary is decades. Um, and this one's kind of on the fast track right this now. This one is currently on, seems seems to be on the fast track. I, um, I have not seen um, as much movement as quickly as we have on this one in a, maybe ever. Um, but at any point, it could get off the fast track too. And what about Papahana Mokuakea? Is that one also, I know that there's been some movement trying to get that into a marine national sanctuary. Is that still ongoing or is that kind of dying down? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, some of the other big proposed sanctuaries that are that are in the news a lot right now is the Chumash Heritage um, Sanctuary proposal off the coast of uh, California and um, the Hudson Valley, or excuse me, Hudson Canyon off the coast of New York and New Jersey are both um, also proposals in different stages of review um, for sanctuary designation. I want to Google search that one. All right, uh, we got some amazing data from the orange coral because Dan did a fantastic job staying on it. So I'm not doing anything. That's a computer. Uh, autopilot, oh. you did a fantastic job <laughs> staying on it. Uh, Alexa, hold on the coral, please. <laughs> we can move on to new and exciting things. All right. All right. We have about an hour left of bottom time before we need to think about coming up. Ooh. Right, well, let's make some tracks west then. You want me to start getting the ship moving, Dan? No. Nope. Moving on to new and interesting things with my red dot here. We've already done the C pen, right? Not on this watch. No. But I think they need some time to look at their data before we start shooting other things. Oh, uh, we're good to move on. How long do you need it on an object to get any useful data? Uh, right now our exposure time is five seconds, but if we could get a, you know, three seconds. Uh, I'll never stay on that for three seconds.
So I would like to get across to the slope again on the other side before we recover. So I would like to get moving in that direction. All right. Okay, you want to bring up the speed again? Sure. Yeah, okay. Daryl, can we switch the top, uh, top right monitor back to uh, main HD? You ready, Dan? Yeah, ready. Bridge nav. Thank you. Can we move five zero meters to six zero? 0 0.5 knots, please. Thank you. A couple big primnoids here. Um, oh, out of yeah. these smaller um, rocks as we leave the heavy rock outcropping. So Brian, at the beginning of this dive, you said that this site was chosen for geology, not biology. And as we're down here, we can clearly see that there's a lot of sand, not as much coral diversity as other spots. Uh, how did you know that it was going to be not that great for biology? Um, first of all, I'm really pleasantly surprised, actually, at what we have seen here. Um, this is frankly better than I expected and the diversity here has been pretty decent. We've seen several families here um, and uh, and, a, and so a lot of big colonies so this is a really biologically a pretty nice dive and um, but the main reason was the slope. Um, so we really generally have a uh, an expectation at shallow slopes um, that we're going to see fewer rocks uh, and I think the maximum slope on this feature and the bathymetry was like 10, 12 degrees or something like that of slope um, and so that's you know a, a, a rough indication that there'll be less hard grounds and less corals so what's generally like the ideal slope that you would like to see I like to get on high 20s low 30s um, and that is by no means a guarantee that we will see corals um, but that is pretty close to a guarantee that we'll see exposed rock, a lot of exposed rock, giving the opportunity for corals to live there. Um, but yeah, that, that's one of my kind of base criteria when picking a dive site is um, if we're looking for corals specifically is I want to see at least one section of slope um, that's in the high 20s somewhere along our dive track. And often that ends up actually being sections of vertical and sections of flat or some combination thereof because of the resolution of the bathymetry it gets averaged out and so we see a lot of smaller areas that are greater and lesser than the 30 degrees of slope but if we kind of at a 30 to 50 meter resolution in the multi-beam that 30 meter or 30 degree slope seems to almost always indicate you know at least big blocky boulders or or some kind of vertical spaces mixed in there across that slope And then for Corley, have you seen anything, um, and I know this is extremely hard while we're in the middle of a dive, but have you seen anything that kind of is telling you why there's this little mountaintop? Is it from later volcanism? Is it from... I don't think we would know that until... Um, you analyze the rocks? Yeah. And I totally forgot to shoot an eDNA bottle back there. We can uh, go back there if you want. Do you have time? The ship's yeah. already moving half a knot. Well, we can stop the ship. Um, no, let's. We're, we're you're already set up in the go form, and the ship's moving. Let's not. Um, uh, she stops now. I can get back there.